Thank you. I appreciate that. How is everyone today? Well, thank you first to Braden Hood for that wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. Thank you to the University of Kentucky for hosting and, of course, to the Young America's Foundation. Um, a special thanks to Keith Work, whose generosity makes this event possible. Um, I also want to thank the wonderful YAF students here on campus. I know it's not easy to be a conservative on a college campus, so thank you for organizing tonight's event. And most of all, I want to give a huge thanks to the nation of Denmark, where a pastor's wife is on trial for crimes against humanity for criticizing her church for sponsoring a gay pride event. Now, the reason that I'm thanking Denmark instead of cursing them is because it demonstrates exactly what happens when the radical left takes their favorite buzzwords and tolerance, for example, inclusion, equity, hashtag no hate, and actually incorporate those buzzwords into law. The perverted law then becomes a weapon, and a weapon of the left, I should say, which they use to subjugate you because they hate you. But let me not get ahead of myself here. I'm here with you tonight to defend the title of my speech, which is easy to do if we are playing by the rules of the radical left. The left actually does hate you. Yes, you, each and every one of you. Now you might be thinking, but Liz, a stupid policy from a liberal doesn't mean the liberal hates you. Some politicians are just stupid. Others are out of touch. Maybe they're even self-serving, but hate is an awfully strong word. Well, let me ask you this tonight. What is hate? Well, according to the left, Dr. Pavi Rossinen is a living, breathing example of hate so visceral that she deserves to be convicted of ethnic agitation, a charge which falls under war crimes and crimes against humanity and carries a penalty of imprisonment for two years, all because of a tweet she sent on Twitter. It is, however, a very offensive tweet. Do you want to hear it? Ready? Here it is. Kirk Ho, who is the head of her church, quote, has stated that he is the official partner of Pride 2019. How does the doctrinal foundation of the church fit in with shame and sin being raised as a matter of pride? End quote. That's it. That's the whole tweet. Is that not the most hateful tweet that you've ever heard? No, no, it's not. It's not. It doesn't target any one person with an ad hominem attack. It doesn't dehumanize any group of people. It doesn't advocate for less equality for any particular people who behave in any particular way. It certainly is not discriminatory, nor is it hateful. In fact, it's one of the most boring tweets I've ever read. According to the radical left, however, Dr. Rossinen, who is a veteran member of the Danish parliament, who is married to a Lutheran pastor, who in reality spoke at best mildly, in defense of what's clearly stated in the Bible as sexual ethics, all Christians are called to follow, is guilty of hate. But again, what is hate? This is yet another example of the radical left hijacking the definition of a word, twisting it until it's unrecognizable, and then redeploying their newly constructed definition to serve their own political agenda. Well, I posit to you tonight that if we reclaim the true definition of hate, then we will find that not only are Christians who believe in biblical sexual ethics not hateful, in fact, we will find that the left hates us, that the left hates you. Now, in order to answer the question, what is hate, because I'm not being rhetorical, I want to answer this question, we must first start with the opposite question. What is love? Well, think back to high school, when your parents warned you about teenage relationships. What did they say? Yes, what did they say? They said love is not a feeling. They said love is action. Love isn't just the infatuation that we feel. It's not even the words that we say, although words, of course, can be illustrative or representative of the love that we feel. But love is a choice, they told us, to behave in a way that serves the other people. Love is a choice to sacrifice for the good of the person we love, to put their needs first, to help them be holy. Well, contrast that with an abusive relationship. What happens in an abusive relationship? Abusive relationships use the other party for their own gratification or their own gain. To use somebody is to abuse them. Even if the abusive party says the words, I love you, even if the abusive party feels some level of infatuation towards the person they abuse, it is their actions that matter, their actions that determine whether their words and their feelings are in fact love or whether they are the opposite of love if their actions are hate. 
This is exactly how the left treats the people that they claim to care about. It's why if we look at the actions of the left, their policies are not just dumb or impractical or unintentionally harmful to you. The left's actions prove that they actually hate you. So let's, let's look at a couple of the most egregious examples here. Who does the left claim that they love? By the way, literally as I was writing this speech, Kamala Harris, vice president, made the following comment, and I was like, thank you for proving my point. This is what she said, and I quote, we are focused on the most vulnerable. And based on my experience, she said, the most vulnerable are women and girls, racial and ethnic minorities, LGBTQI plus people, indigenous people, people with disabilities, migrants and children in the foster care system, end quote. So you guys have heard about the transgender swimmer at the University of Pennsylvania, right? Leah Thomas, now Leah Thomas was born biologically male. Will Thomas was the birth name of this individual. Actually competed for three years as a male before transitioning to a female and has dominated, broken tons of records. I, as a former competitive swimmer, I'm heartbroken to see this happen. Um, this, this dominance of, dominance over biological women, I should say, is, is just continuing even in the, in the wake of the publicity. In a dual meet just this past week against Harvard, Leah Thomas dominated the women once again. And honestly, I read this headline and I wasn't too surprised. This is, after all, a biological male we're talking about. Leah Thomas is a biological male and this is just science. This is, this is not opinion. The British Journal of Sports Medicine published a study last January, ironically, showing that transgender athletes, and I mean people who were born male and now identify as female, still retained a competitive edge over real women, biological women, even after one year of hormone therapy. In fact, the research found that before hormone therapy, biological males who identify as trans outperform women by 31% in push-ups, 15% in sit-ups, and running a mile and a half outperform women by 21%, 21% faster. After two years of testosterone suppressants, males still outperform females by 12%. Keep in mind, two years, that's the International Olympic Committee standard. Now, of course, they paid a ton of money for this study. I could have told them the answer for about five bucks. But none of this, none of this is surprising. We all know this. Everyone sitting in this room knows this. This is reality. In fact, even liberal women recognize that the radical left's transgender agenda is existentially harmful to biological women. A teammate of Leah Thomas at the University of Pennsylvania spoke anonymously for fear of retaliation, which is understandable, about the situation. And here's what this teammate said, quote, women are now third class citizens. Leah was not even close to being competitive as a man in the 50 and 100. But just because Leah is biologically a man, Leah is just naturally better than many females in the 50 and 100 or anything that Leah wasn't good at as a man. The top people at the NCAA who are on the board of directors, they are not protecting women's rights. Because it's women, they don't care. Now get this. This teammate goes on to say, quote, I am typically liberal, but this is past that. This is so wrong. This doesn't even make any sense. I can't just sit back and let something like this happen. I'm not just going to sit back and say my rights are being taken away too bad. It's embarrassing, she said, that people aren't speaking out more, end quote. This is a liberal college student. And yet, we are told by the left that the left is a champion of women. Think of Kamala Harris's words that she spoke just yesterday. We are focused on the most vulnerable, she said, and in my experience, that is women. Well, if this behavior by the left, these actions by the left, which threaten the entire sport, of women swimming, threaten to destroy the entire idea of women's sports overall, reduces biological women to second-class citizens in their own gender category, redefines the word woman to allow any mentally ill man to appropriate our gender and use it for his own pseudo-achievement in pursuit of snaps from woke groupies. If these actions are love, then love is hate, and the left hates women. This dichotomy is true for every single so-called women's issue as defined by the left, gender equity. The left claims this is about equal representation of women. The reality, it reduces women to tokens in the workplace. Women are now unsure of whether they were hired or promoted based on their own qualification or whether they're a necessary token required to fill a gender quota. The gender pay gap, 
The left claims it's about fighting for equal pay for equal work, protecting women against institutional sexism. The reality, the gender pay gap is not about sexism. It's about different choices that men and women make, not only in the workplace, but in their own lives, their own personal lives that impact their salaries. And by demonizing these different choices that women tend to make and painting those choices as inferior to the choices that men tend to make just because the choices are different, the left is actually engaging in sexism, telling women what we should feel, what we should want, what we should pursue, and what we should actually do. The examples here are endless. Why? Because the left hates women, and their actions prove this. In Canada, a new piece of legislation passed unanimously in the parliament, both houses, which criminalizes helping children overcome gender dysphoria. Now, that's obviously not how the radical left portrays or presents this piece of legislation. The left says they are protecting children from abusive conversion therapy. But if you ignore their words and look instead at their actions, you find in the language of the bill itself, let me just read this to you. This is from the legislation itself. Quote, whereas conversion therapy causes harm to society, because, among other things, it is based on and propagates myths and stereotypes about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, including the myth that heterosexuality, cisgender gender identity, and gender expression that conforms to the sex assigned to a person at birth are to be preferred over other sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expressions. And whereas, in light of those harms, it is important to discourage and denounce the provision of conversion therapy in order to protect the human dignity and equality of all Canadians now, therefore, Her Majesty, by and with the advice and consent of the Senate and House of Commons of Canada, enacts as follows. They then define conversion therapy. Conversion therapy, states the legislation, means a practice, treatment, or service designed to change a person's sexual orientation to heterosexual, change a person's gender identity to cisgender, change a person's gender expression so that it conforms to the sex assigned to the person at birth. Listen to this one, though repress or reduce non-heterosexual attraction or sexual behavior, repress a person's non-cisgender gender identity, or repress or reduce a person's gender expression that does not conform to the sex assigned to the person at birth. It's pretty shocking, isn't it? So what's presented to us as a ban on abusive conversion therapy actually criminalizes a Christian counselor, for example, telling a promiscuous teenager, you know, it's probably not a good idea for you to be promiscuous if, you're, if you have same-sex partners. Those are two pretty different things. Remember, too, nearly 90% of children under the age of 18 who suffer from gender dysphoria recover by adulthood if they do not transition socially or medically. Conversely, if they are transitioned, they are subject to non-FDA-approved puberty-blocking drugs. And when I say non-FDA-approved puberty-blocking drugs, I'm talking about same the same medication that some states used to sterilize, to castrate convicted child sex predators. These children are, are subject to irreversible surgery then that mutilates their bodies, permanent sterilization, rendering them infertile for life, in addition to the fact, of course, that none of the above is curative for gender dysphoria. So compare the words to the actions. What the left says is completely irrelevant because their actions prove the left hates children. In Flint, Michigan, the school district there recently announced they would return to remote learning, and I hate that phrase, more accurately, it is described as Zoom school, indefinitely. Indefinitely. Based on what science, you might ask? Well, the answer is none. Children are very low risk for severe COVID-19, particularly with the Omicron variant. Yet even the Surgeon Gen General under Biden acknowledges a tremendous mental health crisis sweeping our nation's youth. Suicide rates for teenagers and pre-teenagers, children skyrocketing in the face of lockdowns, face masks, fear, and a pervasive poisonous narrative that other people aren't people. They are pathogens to be avoided at all costs. The left hates children and they hate you, so they will use your children to get you. At the same time, while the left is relegating kids to indefinite Zoom school, the left is also actively trying to remove any choice from parents that the parents might have to choose other options for schooling for their kids. They are against school choice, the left is. They, try, they are actively trying to prohibit homeschooling, the left is. They even have, in their crosshairs, parental consent to medical procedures for minors. 
in the state of California, there is a bill right now in the California State Senate. It's Senate Bill 866. It was introduced by Senator Scott Weiner, who is living up to his name. <laughs> this bill would allow children as young as 12 years old to be vaccinated without the, without the consent of their parents. Now, this bill is presented as just about COVID-19, and it's presented as if it is an accommodation. It is presented as an accommodation to parents' schedules. This is what Scott Weiner writes about it. He says, this gives young people the autonomy to receive life-saving vaccines regardless of their parents' beliefs or work schedules. This is essential to their physical and mental health. But this is not just about the COVID-19 vaccine, as terrible as that would be in and of itself. This applies to all FDA-approved vaccines, including ones that just have emergency use authorization. So a 12-year-old child, against the consent of his parents, pressured, perhaps, by school counselors, can be subject to these medical procedures. If this is not an assault on parental rights, then I don't know what is. The left hates parents. Think about the definition of an abusive relationship that I spoke about before, when one party uses the other party for gratification or gain. Using someone is abusive, and the left is using parents to consolidate political power in the hands of government that they control. That is abusive. The left hates parents, and their actions prove this. What about kids in foster care? We're just going to go down the line of Kamala Harris's comments. The left's prescribed solution to the very real issues that we do face in our foster care system is to kill the unborn baby before she is born so as to avoid the foster care system altogether. Is that love? Let me state the obvious here. Murder is hate. The left actually celebrates the abortion committed against 65 million unborn baby girls and boys that have happened in our country since Roe v. Wade became the law of the land. The left hates foster kids. The left hates unborn babies. The left hates mothers. Their actions prove this. In fact, People Magazine, I saw this just this past weekend, People Magazine published a pictorial for the 49th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. Uh, this pictorial contained quotes from celebrities, photos and quotes from celebrities who have had abortions and why they got those abortions. Now, they presented this pictorial, People Magazine did, in a positive light. They claim these celebrities are speaking out um, about their own experience to support other women in similar circumstances to know that it's okay to have an abortion. But there's a common theme in these statements from these celebrities. So if I may, I'd like to read a few of these quotes. Uma Thurman said the abortion that she got was, quote, the hardest decision of my life. She said it caused me anguish then and saddens me even now. Alyssa Milano said it was not an easy choice. It was not something I wanted, but it was something I needed. Amber Tamblyn said, it was one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make. I still think about it to this day. Mila Djokovic said, it was one of the most horrific experiences I have ever gone through. I still have nightmares about it. I was alone and helpless. Nicki Minaj said, it was the hardest thing I've ever gone through. It's haunted me all my life. Sharon Osbourne said, I had an abortion at 17. It was the worst thing I ever did. I was terrified. She describes the abortion clinic as full of other young girls, and we were all terrified and looking at each other, and nobody was saying a bloody word. I howled my way through it, and it was horrible. She says, I would never recommend it to anyone else because it comes back to haunt you. Jamila Jamil and Minka Kelly both claim that the abortions that they had were best for the baby to avoid poverty or being unwanted, or so they claim. But what is the common thread here? The common thread is regret, trauma, and coercion. Who propagates this abuse of women? The left does. The left who claims to love women. They don't. The left hates women and hates unborn babies. Do you see this pattern emerging? Love is not a feeling. Love is not only words. Love is actions, and so is hate. Hate is not a tweet from a pastor's wife about why her church is sponsoring a gay pride parade. Hate is not offending the left or contradicting liberal policies. Hate is an action. Hate is how the left treats women and children and parents and the LGBTQ community and babies in foster care and unborn babies. 
I've almost run out of time to describe how the abuse inflicted on the left by or uh, the abuse inflicted by the left on migrants and minorities. Suffice to say this, my husband is a medical provider and he worked for the Border Patrol. He worked in a Border Patrol detention facility. He provided medical care to the migrants that were held there after they crossed illegally into our country. And when I'm talking migrants, I'm talking MS-13 gang members, I'm talking drug traffickers, human traffickers, convicted felons. And you know what? The Border Patrol did separate grown men from women and children. They did separate teenage boys from women and children. They did separate these families. Why? To protect them. Because some of the people held in these facilities were predators. And you don't house grown men with little children. You don't house teenage boys with women and children. You don't house young teenage boys with grown men for their own safety. And yet, the left demonized this separation. Why did the left demonize this separation? Because the left hates migrants. Look at any one of the left's policies that encourages migrants to come here, to come here illegally, to claim, falsely claim asylum. And while they're encouraging this for their own political goal, 30% of women and children who are trafficked to our southern border are sexually assaulted and raped because the left hates migrants. And why does the left, by the way, who claims to champion black people as well, why do they support the Black Lives Matter movement, demonizing police, burning down buildings, and ransacking black-owned businesses, and feeding a false narrative, a completely, empirically, provably false narrative, that police harm black people solely because they are black, which leads leftists in government to defund police, which hurts black people the most, well, by now, the answer should be very obvious, because the left hates black people. So no, stupid policies from liberals are not just accidental from stupid politicians or from out-of-touch elitists or even from self-serving hypocrites. Categorically, down the line, listen to Kamala Harris speak at herself. Every single group or demographic that the left claims to love, they hate. So tonight, I tell you this, don't fall for their lies. Don't be their pawn. Don't let the left sacrifice you or your loved ones in the name of their social experiments and their socialism. You deserve better. So think for yourself, regardless of what your characteristics or your demographic may be. Use critical thought. Question authority. Follow the facts. Trust yourself. And don't let radical leftists in politics or in the media, or those blaring their nonsense from the pulpit of corporate wokeism, or poisoning our minds in pop culture with cultural Marxism, or anybody bully you into being a sheep. They hate us, so let us together reject them. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, Ms. Wheeler would like to take your questions. So if you do have a question, if you would join my colleague down here at the end of the line, um, and you can ask one question. We just do ask that you would keep it brief so we can get through all the questions. Um, and then when you're done, if you would go back through the back of the line um, till the end of the Q&A session. Um, so with that, uh, we can take our first question. Hello. Hi, uh, what's your name? Caleb. Hi, Caleb. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Uh, my question is, given the fact that, as you say, the left actually hates us, um, isn't it time to start considering what many people have been calling a national divorce or separating entirely from these people, you know, dissolving the political bands that connect us to these people who hate us and everything about us? Well, I hear you quoting from, this is a good question, I hear you quoting from the Declaration of Independence to dissolve the political bands which uh, connect us to another and to assume among the powers of the earth, you know, our right to self-determination and self-government. The problem with this line of thought is the reason that the founders dissolved the political bands which connected them to the tyrant King George is because they had exhausted all other recourses. There was no other recourse uh, for them 
to right the wrongs or to to abolish these ties that they that the tyrant King George was using to abuse them. And so I don't think we're anywhere close to that in our country. I think they're that sometimes it can feel hopeless, it can seem hopeless if you turn on the mainstream media and listen to them telling all white people that they're racist and all black people that they're oppressed, hearing them say that capitalism is wrong and that Marxism is the way to go. But truthfully, you and I have a tremendous amount of recourse. We can run for government at the state or the local level, at the national level. We can use new media to challenge these um, to challenge the radical leftists. We can, I mean, there's so many things that we can do. We can I mean, look at what parents did, taking over school boards that were teaching critical race theory and transgender bathrooms in Loudoun County. I mean, we have so much power as individuals that we are not even kind of close to dissolving the political bands which connect us to the radical left. In fact, it's the radical left that is misapplying the truths and our inherent rights which are codified into the Constitution. They are misapplying them, and so they are in violation of our founding principles, um, and which makes it theoretically at least, all the easier to correct it. We're not anywhere close to uh, splitting apart as a nation. Thank you for your question. Good evening, Liz. Hi there, what's your name? Mahmoud. How you doing? I'm doing great. So my question to you is, given that the left hates all the people that you mentioned, how do we like, how should I tell you this? How do we tell those same people to like ignite the idea that they should start questioning them. Like for example, as a Muslim, after Afghanistan, I switched political parties because I knew after 20 years of the media hating Muslims, I mean, of the media portraying the Republicans as hating Muslims, it turns out Biden allowed the killing of a million kids in Afghanistan. So how do we spark the, the idea that the minorities that the left claims to love, how should uh, tell them to start questioning? Yeah, it's a great question. Were you a Democrat and you switched to Republican? Um, it was sort of like it was sort of like a moderate Democrat where I didn't talk about abortion until you know I found out that my uncle was lost to a miscarriage. But then, as I thought of that, millions of uncles, aunts, grandparents were lost. Our heritage was lost. Well, first of all, welcome to the good side. We're glad you're here. You. Um, <laughs> no, this is a really good question, and it starts. I mean, I can tell you what I do. What I do is I come to college campuses and I try to talk to people who might not otherwise hear the reality of the thing. I think the radical left has overshot um, on these policies across the country. Again, we can talk about critical race theory, which teaches that white children are racist just inherently based on the color of their skin, or that black children are oppressed inherently based on the color of their skin. And parents can see, regardless of their political party, parents can see that this is, this is evil, this is poisonous, this is, not, this is not American, this is not something that we want taught to our children. You can expose, the, you can expose this, um, very extreme version of Democrat policies in all kinds of different issues right now because the, the Democrat party has been hijacked by these very radical leftists. So think about school choice, for example. Ron DeSantis, governor of Florida, is in the news for a lot of different, a lot of different things, but before he was popular, the reason that he won the, uh, the gubernatorial race against Andrew Gillum in Florida was because he ran on a platform of school choice. He ran on a platform of empowering parents to choose what school, even a public school that their child went to, regardless of what zip code they lived in. And you can contrast that with what the Democrat Andrew Gillum was offering. He called charter schools a siphon on the public school system. And Ron DeSantis won because 30,000 school choice moms, they're called, meaning they are black women who are registered Democrats who voted for the Democrat Senate candidate in the state of Florida, actually voted for Ron DeSantis, the Republican candidate, because he was offering directly to them, using an issue that mattered to them and their families, saying, hey, I know exactly what you are asking me to give you, and I'm offering that to you. Your best option is through the Republican Party that gives you the choice and takes it away from a government official. So, like I said, you can talk about critical race theory, you can talk about school choice, you can talk about abortion. I mean, 71% of the American people, Republican and Democrat, pro-life and pro-abortion, think that abortion should only be legal in the first trimester, that second trimester and third trimester abortions should be illegal. And yet, contrast that, that's public opinion, contrast that with what our, our elected officials in Washington, D.C. think. They want abortion up until the moment of birth, maybe, according to the former governor of Virginia, maybe even after birth, this is completely 
completely this disconnect is extreme and every single issue that I can think of at least I could go on and on about this but every single issue I can think of the Democrats have overshot so you and I we are called to expose this to make sure that people know that their views are not represented by the Democrat Party that the Democratic Party is actually using them abusing them exploiting them and then when they when they fulfill their political agenda using the people they're throwing the people they're throwing the people to the trash thank you sorry I used to be a Democrat <laughs> <laughs> you are forgiven welcome to our side <laughs> Hello. Hi there. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. So when you were talking, I uh, you mentioned Canada's uh, law about conversion therapy, and you went over all of the details, and you didn't seem to agree with that. So I'm kind of wondering, would you agree with some type of ban on certain forms of conversion therapy, which scientifically is definitely a bad thing? And I think that also plays into how we view parents' rights, and do parents have an absolute right to their children, or how much of an, how much of a right to autonomy do children have? Sure, this is a great question. So what was really important about this piece of legislation in Canada is actually the same thing that, it's the same, or very similar, at least language-wise, to a piece of legislation that was introduced by, ironically, Senator Scott Weiner in the state of California several years ago that I was instrumental in derailing. And the important thing to look at is how they define conversion therapy, right? Because how they define conversion therapy in the California bill, but also in the Canadian bill, isn't really a ban on conversion therapy. It is a ban on um, even the idea that someone could counsel a teenager, a homosexual teenager, to behave in a certain way, meaning a parent might say, listen, we don't want you to have different people spending the night all the time. That's not how you behave in our roof or under our roof or a youth pastor saying, you know what? You know, studies have shown scientifically that the more sexual partners you have, the less you're able to bond with other people. We really recommend that you not behave in this way for your own good um, because we know that that's best for you. I mean, these types of things are illegal under the definition of conversion therapy that the left is proposing. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is when we're talking about adults, do I think that conversion therapy should be banned even if it doesn't work? No. There are a lot of weight loss products that I think are don't work too. And I think that people, adults certainly have a right to take them, a right to engage in them. They can do whatever they want. I mean, I think that you know, voodoo isn't real either. I think that there are a lot of a lot of crazy things that people engage in ostensibly for their own well-being that simply don't work. And people have the right to do that. Now, when we're talking about abuse, and this is what the left likes to do, they like to conflate abuse with conversion therapy. Do I think abuse should be prohibited? Yes, it already is. It's already against the law to abuse a child. It's already against the law to harm, physically harm a child. So what I always like to say is the left tries to paint conversion therapy as being one of those abusive, pray the gay away camps where young boys were beaten if they admitted to having any same sex attraction. That of course is wrong. That is morally wrong. Nobody disagrees with that, which is exactly why the radical left wants you to think of that when they say conversion therapy. So. That is my answer about conversion therapy. When it comes to parental rights, I do believe parents have dominion over their children. I don't think the government has dominion over their children unless the fundamental, inherent, God-given rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are being violated. If the children are being violated unless they are being physically abused. I mean, we have a pretty high bar for government involvement in parental rights. We have a pretty high bar for how, um, how we allow parents to be bad parents, and we should. I think it makes you a bad parent if you just feed your child fast food every day and your child becomes very unhealthy. But do you have a right to do that as a parent? Yeah, you do. You have a right to do that. I also think it makes you a bad parent if you allow your child, your little child or your teenager to watch you know, R-rated ex sexually explicit movies. But do you have a right to do that? Yeah, you have a right to do that. There are a lot of things that parents do or can do that they have a right to do that can be argued is harmful to the child and they're still allowed to do it. So the line that we should draw for what parents are allowed to engage in um, before the government comes in and says, nope, wait a second, you're not allowed to do that, should be very high because when you give government authority over the family, they do not recognize a limiting principle. They do not agree with, I mean, they do not agree with the ideology of half of the country. Look at what happened again in California, what happened in Canada. They are trying to criminalize, actually criminalize biblical sexual ethics. And so if we give 
if we give the government parental rights, if we give government dominion over people's children, then we are essentially saying, well, parents, Christian parents or Jewish parents or even Muslim parents may not have the right to, pra to pass down and teach their children the principles or the religious beliefs that they adhere to as a family. And so as a country, it's extremely important that we pr protect the family unit. It's the foundation on which this country is built. Thank you for your question. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> um, one thing I just wanted to mention first, uh, I come from the great state of Florida, so I feel very privileged to have all those types of freedoms and I feel very safe in my home. Um, so on to my question, which I've uh, written down. Um, so I, I, just, I was just curious, as I'm sure you're aware, we've been in the middle of like culture war, um, pretty, pretty fierce culture war recently, and it's only been escalating. And the left just seems to be getting more extreme. Um, I'm curious if you have an opinion on how we could maybe somehow just end this one way or another, and if you think something like the 2022 election might help solve these types of issues that we're having and start focus on real life issues. Well, I guess I would challenge your point that the culture wars aren't real life issues. I think that they are, they spark the passion and the outrage on both sides to the extent that they do because of their importance, because the role of the family, the role of parents, the role of marriage, the role of sex, the role of life, all of these things are really tantamount. They are, they are the essence of who we are as a society, of who we are as human beings. And so when these issues are threatened in some ways, it threatens the fabric of a society. And I believe that's what the left is trying to do. They are trying to threaten the fabric of our society. They are trying to tear down the institutions our country is built on, whether that be governmental institutions like the Supreme Court or the Senate or the Electoral College, whether that's cultural institutions like gender, like marriage, like the family, like parental rights. They are trying to um, tear down these institutions, including, you know, we saw that with the Black Lives Matter movement. They're trying to tear down the criminal justice system. They're trying to abolish due process. They are trying to undermine these institutions on purpose. Again, this is this goes back to what I was saying in my speech tonight. This is not arbitrary. This is not just stupid politicians, out of touch politicos, elitists that don't understand the ramifications of their policies on everyday Americans. No, they're doing this on purpose because they have to undermine the institutions of our country in order to usher in Marxism because they understand these leftists understand that Karl Marx's vision of a worker-led revolution isn't going to happen. The workers are not going to rise up. And so these Marxists, these leftists need another vanguard. So they divide us by race primarily. They divide us with this gender ideology, hoping that this causes so much outrage, this causes so much division that we actually do from within tear down our own institutions so that then they can usher Marxism in. So I don't think that it's going to go away in 2022. I do think that we as conservatives are called to fight these battles. I know sometimes social issues are uncomfortable for conservatives to talk about. We might prefer talking about the economy or national security or foreign policy, but we really, it's incumbent, especially on Gen Z, especially on the millennial generation to speak about these uncomfortable topics because this is where the left is waging their attack. And if we don't stop it, then, then it will be too late. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for your question. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Do you serve in the Army? I do. Thank you for your service. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on the retirement of Justice Breyer, and who do you think on Biden's shortlist is the most dangerous to Republican goals? Oh, um, first, let me go on a rant, which I have been sharing with uh, friends and family across the board for the past two days. It is so fundamentally insulting to all women for Biden to say, I am going to appoint a black woman to serve on the Supreme Court. Like what could possibly be more insulting to women? What could this is what it's called is tokenism, right? That he is picking someone based first on her immutable characteristic, her gender and the color of her skin. And it's tokenism, it's two times. It's tokenism times two because it's not just about her gender. It's not just about uh, it's also about the color of her skin. And what happens if you engage in this kind of tokenism is it harms all women all across the country because then the next woman who is promoted or who gets offered a job, who achieves some kind of achievement is going to stand there and wonder to herself, did I get this job? Was I promoted based on my qualifications because I earned it, because I deserve it? Or am I just 
am I just a gender quota? Am I just a racial quota? And what's worse than that, what's worse than women thinking this in their own heads, men are gonna be thinking this too. Think about, look, men are shaking their head in the audience right now. Think about being in a corporate boardroom. Think about if a woman is promoted in the workplace and a man is not, what do you think that man's gonna be thinking? He's gonna be thinking, did she really deserve that? Or is it just because she's a girl? This is so fundamentally damaging to everything that women have fought to achieve in the last hundred years in our country. Biden, Biden should be absolutely ashamed of himself and watch very closely. This goes back to what I said in my speech tonight. Watch very closely for which people, Republican and Democrat, actually speak up and say, wait a second, this is really insulting. This is really harmful to all women because the people who don't speak up, well, they hate women because it's very obvious what this does to women across our country. So that's my long answer. My short answer is all of his choices are abysmal. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Liz. I'm Hi Chase. Uh, I'm actually a big fan of Verdict. Uh, I've heard you on the Senator's podcast a few times. Well, thank times. you. I appreciate that. So, yeah, you walking out here kind of give me flashbacks to the mornings on the treadmill a little bit. So, there you go. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but my question is, right now in the United States, I mean, I'm sure you're well aware, we have massive immigration flowing in through our southern border. I mean, millions and millions of people unchecked coming into the United States. But not only that, uh, Caucasian birth rates are also declining. Uh, so a lot of people are speculating that soon within the United States, uh, Caucasians will actually make up the minority of people uh, in America. Now, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Tucker Carlson, and he's talked about this issue a lot, saying that it's very basic. If you replace the people in a country that, I've, that have been there for for a previous of 200 years, it's no longer the same country anymore. Do you believe that's a threat or if that's just a natural progression of society? Well, I think the first thing is really important is to separate race from culture. And that's what I wanna do right now. I don't think that the race of individuals is important. Um, the culture of a country, meaning what values and what principles the people hold or the government stands for, that is, that is very important to talk about, but I would encourage you and challenge you to drop the racial aspect from that question because that's not important. What's important is a country cannot be a country without having sovereign borders. A country cannot be a nation of laws, and we are a nation of laws, if our laws are not being enforced, if they are being routinely broken as they are. Our country will be fundamentally transformed if we allow it to be two classes of people, people who are expected to follow the law and people who are not expected to follow the law. We know this impact on taxpayers. We know the burden that it places on um, people who work and pay part of their paycheck to the government to have that part of their paycheck fund other people's law-breaking activities. We also know it's fundamentally unfair to those who have gone the right way, who have come to our nation through our legal immigration systems. Now, there's no argument, I think, that our legal immigration systems need to be reformed. Um, and we can have a debate sometime on what that looks like, You know, what level of immigration is best for a nation. That's a valid conversation, a valid debate to have. But I would circle back and really challenge you to leave the racial aspect of that at the door, because when it is tinged with race, then there is an insinuation that culture has something to do with race or that people are who they are based on the color of their skin, and I would categorically reject that. Thank you for the question. Hello. Hi there, what's your name? My name is Arafat. Uh, I'm from China. Well, I'm glad you're here tonight. Thanks for yes, being here. And uh, I'm a really good student of Marxism, but anyway, I'm a minority in China, and I am... I've been there, I lived and I born there uh, for 16 years. And then I do have a very, very uh, rich experiment on living under the socialism or communism. And I came to the United States in 2016. And until now I'm kind of more involved in politics and my major is politics. I'm the Uyghur minority in, in China. And uh, hopefully everyone knows what's going on with my race, uh, ethnicity. So when I came to this country and I have I have seen the young people and all this, because China have experienced 10 years of cultural revolution, and I know what they are up to because I, you know, the communist stuff. So kind of seeing those young students are very kind of, some, some people are like very proud of themselves to be a liberal. And then like, they don't really know what they're up to, but they just, you know, when they see me as conservative, they were like, you're a minority, why would you do that? I was like, because I come from the country that it make me head a lot. So what can we do as the young student in this United University of Kentucky 
to help others to realize the, you know, the truth. Because I myself, as a single person, I'm even scared that my country, my country's hand is everywhere. They can even, you know, I'm really scared of being political act activity in the other country because I'm still the citizen of that country. And, uh, but what can American student and me include can do to help persuade those left students to realize the truth that we are, I am actually a suffering and I don't want this country to become the country I came from because I just want to enjoy the freedom and now this country is turning to the something that I don't want to see. So what can young sure. people can do? Well, it sounds like you have a very compelling life story. And the first thing that I would say is welcome to our country. We're glad to have you here and continue to share your story with as many people who will listen. As you know, one of the reasons that the radical left wins arguments or typically wins younger voters is because they target younger voters with emotion. The Republican Party, unfortunately, tends to trot out white papers and think tanks and policy proposals, and it's very boring and dry, even if, even if they're technically correct. What the left does is they speak to young people where young people are. They use emotion to elicit an emotional response that makes that makes young people want, just based on their feeling, to support the Democrat Party or to feel like they're progressive. But what you can do is you have an actual personal story that's relatable and compelling and important to tell to young people. And the emotion is not emotional manipulation. The emotion is real because your story is real. So I would encourage you to share it with every person that you possibly can and also to pose questions. What I do when I'm talking directly to a leftist trying to change their mind is I, I try to hold back all of the data that I have, try to resist the data dump, if you will, because that's always my inclination is to be like, I have a thousand reasons why you're wrong. And one of the things I do is I try to hold all that back and just ask one question, which will point out the inconsistency of their viewpoint. So for example, a question that you could ask would be, okay, well, in communist China, what happened when they tried to transition into a socialist communist nation is, what was it, 40, 50 million people were either killed or died of starvation why would the United States be different if we ushered socialism in here? And then allow them to answer that question, because of course the answer is there's no limiting principle on socialism and communism. What happened there would certainly happen here if we adopted similar policies. And by asking those eye-opening questions, you might be able to plant that seed in um, your fellow students' minds to see, to see the truth. And at the same time, you can ask the same kind of questions about progressive policies. You can say, well, the left claims that they're for minorities, but you know, what, what do they do for minorities? Is their defund the police movement helping black citizens in black neighborhoods or is it hurting black citizens in black neighborhoods since black Americans are the most likely to be victims of violent crime? So you can pose these questions that you know the answer to that are sort of closed window questions that really might help open their eyes along with your story. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, good evening, Ms. Wheeler. Um, my name is Elijah. Um, you mentioned very briefly at the end of your speech about the left's false narrative concerning police shootings here in America today. Um, I'm curious as to what your take on the, the phenomenon of fatal police shootings is, because I believe current data suggests that there have been about 7,000 of them since uh, 2016. Sure. So you have to really parse through that data. And what you'll find when you parse through that data is the vast, vast, vast majority of those police shootings, the victim was armed and dangerous. So I believe, I believe the actual data is um, in, in the low 20s, I believe, for the past, I don't know what it is for 2021. I'm not sure the FBI has released data from last year. So the data I'm talking about was from 2020 or 2019. Um, but it's actually less than two dozen um, individuals, black individuals who are unarmed, who are shot by police. But of course, we have to understand that unarmed does not mean that they are not posing a lethal threat to the police officer, because you don't have a, to have a gun to pose a lethal threat. You could be trying to run over a cop with a car. You could have, you know, some other weapon that's not a firearm. Um, and the data shows there have been statistical analysis of police departments all across the country that have found that police officers are actually more likely to fire their weapon, to engage when lethal force when the suspect is white versus when the suspect is black because they're fearful of the Ferguson effect. They're fearful of being fired and being vilified by the media and being prosecuted for simply following the laws that govern law enforcement. So the Black Lives Matter movement 
it really just lies. They misrepresent the truth. They deliberately misrepresent the truth in order to foment fear. They want black people to be fearful every time they are pulled over and it's a routine traffic stop. They want black people to be fearful because if black people are fearful of their lives, if they believe that police are um, posing a lethal threat to them, then black people are going to be more likely to vote Democrats when the Democrats say, we will save you from this by defunding the police. So really, if you look at the statistical analysis, you look at the studies, you'll find that police-involved shootings, especially of unarmed black men, are not at all what the Democrats portray it to be. Thank you for your question. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, this will be the last question of the night. Thank you. Good. That's great. Uh, Liz, welcome. Uh, my name is Walter Ferrier. I'm a professor in the business school here. And more importantly, I'm the faculty advisor for the local YAF chapter. Well, so thank wanna, you so much for doing yeah, that. I want to extend my uh, welcome and thanks to you uh, for coming here. In my view, one form of hate is ostracism. And I think a lot of the students in here, and, and on occasion, we faculty feel somewhat ostracized. Uh, due to our conservative principles. But one arena in which ostracism is taking place is in the military. Non-vaxxed naval officers, a whole batch of them were fired today. Uh, also, naval personnel, well, military personnel in general are being hunted down because of their conservative principles or their tendency to be deplorable. And this comes at a bad time when uh, the Russian forces are on the, on the brink of perhaps moving into Ukraine. So what are your thoughts about ostracism, vaccinations, conservative thought in the military? Sure, it's a great question. And again, thank you, Professor, so much for sponsoring the Young America's Foundation group on this campus. It, it makes the experience very different for students when they do have that community to go to. And not all faculty are willing to do that. So I appreciate that on behalf of all the students here. Um, ostracization is real. It is a form of hate. It is, it is a dehumanizing of that person. So first of all, let's, let's talk about this issue by issue. The first issue, vaccination in the military. Congress can actually solve this issue by passing legislation that says that if you uh, hold a sincere religious belief against certain vaccinations, that you are allowed to have a religious exemption to that, or that the military cannot mandate vaccines as long as you have informed consent about what the consequences could be. So Congress can actually take care of this issue. So we know that the leadership of the military is very political, that you are promoted oftentimes in the military based on your ability to say uh, yes, sir, and not your ability to call out corruption and to hold the others accountable. So turn instead to your congressmen because they are actually the civilians in charge of the military. It's, it's really a shocking thing in our country, not just in the military, to see this segregation based on your personal medical decision. I myself am not vaccinated against COVID-19 and I would never get the COVID-19 vaccine. And I don't say this to be bombastic. I say this because why would I? I am at very low risk of COVID-19. I've actually already had it and recovered perfectly fine because I'm at very low risk of it. And so I have natural immunity. And um, because of that, we know from the CDC that it doesn't, the vaccine doesn't prevent you from contracting the virus. It doesn't prevent you from transmitting the virus. So this idea of universal vaccination is, is moot. This idea that it's not about you and your risk, that it's about the community as a whole, um, has been debunked. So it then reverts back to your personal, your personal decision. And my personal decision is I'm not at risk, so I'm, I'm not willing to suffer the short-term consequences. We actually don't know what the long-term consequences are, especially for people with autoimmune issues like me. It's not been studied. We have no idea. I refuse to be party to the use of aborted fetal cell lines, no matter the distance between um, the vaccine and an abortion. It's simply not enough for me to justify it. And it's really shocking in our culture that we have normalized this idea that it's okay to ask each other about our personal medical procedures because it requires people to share things that they might not otherwise want to share. I'm, I'm in the public eye, and so I understand that that's part of my job. I want to share with you the reasons that I do things, but the segregation that's happening, I just went to Washington, D.C. last week, and restaurants are empty. You go in there, and you're asked about your vaccination status. There's a cloud and an aura over the city. People are depressed because they know this is is, this is tyranny. And so it's really up to us. We know that politicians, when given the opportunity to abuse their power, will abuse their power. It's not, a, it's not a question of when, it's a question of if. And so it's up to us, the American people, to say enough. 
to say, I will not comply with this. This is not the America that I will live in for myself and my children. And, you know, I, I will be perfectly frank with you here and say I've been a little disheartened the last two years that this line that I thought when politicians cross this line, the American people would finally say enough. I've been pretty disappointed to see this line get pushed further and further down the road. And Americans say, oh, well, you know, 15 days just below the spread. Now it's two years and counting. Or masks for six weeks will eradicate the virus. Now it's going to be masks until all eternity. Or, you know, six-month-olds with three courses of the COVID vaccine. Are you kidding me? Um, th this, this entire idea that we are now living under medical tyranny is something that you and I, all of us, should speak out against. And until we do... The left is going to be able to weaponize ostracization and ostracization, as we all know from the lockdowns and from the dehumanizing aspect of masks, is absolutely brutal and we shouldn't allow them to wage that over us. Bingo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. It's a pleasure. It's an honor to talk to you. And I encourage you, I challenge all of you on your college campus, go out, talk to the students who disagree with you the most, engage with them, invite them to debate you, to debate you, ask them the questions, ask them, prove to me that the left is a champion for you. Prove to me that their policies are good for you. Show me evidence that what the left says is congruent with what the left does. And what you'll find is you'll find that they won't be able to answer you. You'll find that they'll try to cancel you, that they might have to run away to your safe space, but you might somewhere plant that seed, plant that seed that's necessary for the idea that conservatives and Republicans and limited government and individual freedom and inherent human rights, that that's the answer to our cultural and societal ills, that that's the answer to what every person, regardless of their politics, wants out of their life. So again, I challenge you, I deputize you, go out on your college campuses, do this, and thank you again for having me here tonight. It's really an honor and a pleasure to talk to you. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my podcast anywhere that you get your pods. It's the Liz Wheeler Show. Thank you. Thank you for having me.